Welcome back to the Darting Through the Faith podcast. I'm Father Sean Wilson, and scheming with me always <laughs> is Julia Monin. Julia, uh, yeah. welcome to Shenanigans. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah. thought that was last week. I thought we were done with that. But oh, no. We're shenanigans back. go on until the second coming. Thank- and- <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Right. I hope it's good. Right. We were talking about scheming. To, we were. To do... Getting in cahoots. Getting in cahoots to... Just kind of Pick mess on with Grace, Grace a yeah. Bit. Do some things. She's got it coming, you know. Right, and at first my initial response was, "No, I don't want to pick on Grace," but you turned me around. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're so inspiring. Hi, man. You were just reading a message about how your uh, mohawk last week has inspired others to maybe consider it to as well. At least consider it, yeah. Yeah, like father, like sons, you know. That's that's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So just takes one crazy dancing guy. You ever seen this video? So there's a video of the this guy who's at a. Uh, it, it's called the 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 first follower. So there's this crazy dancing guy, and mm-hmm. he's dancing at like a concert, and it's really terrible, like video quality. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he's just dancing for himself for like a minute straight, and it's mm-hmm. just like this guy's bizarre, going crazy at this outdoor like you know like concert in a mm-hmm. field, and there's not like a ton of people, mm-hmm. but he just starts dancing, mm-hmm. and this guy talks about like over top his commentary about how important it is to have a first follower, mm-hmm. that it's the first follower that takes this risk to to mm-hmm. follow the leader and gives permission for other people to follow, mm-hmm. and so it's like yeah, you need the you got to be the dancing guy, but it's the first follower, the first one that comes in to say, all right, I'm going to hitch my wagon to this train. Um, hmm. So this is so I'm looking for a first follower out there, <laughs> world. Right. So That's profound. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's really kind of insightful. <laughs> it really is. All right. Yeah. Well, we so, shall see. If we shall see. If there's more mohawks in, your, in the parish pews. Well, the one I was reading is from out of town. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, so wow. somebody I know from okay. Cincinnati. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Shout out Brian Dully. I think he's gotten a shout out before. Brian. Nice. Your but, reach. Uh, it's just huge. Yeah. Yeah. We'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> just scanning, spanning the globe, scanning the globe, spanning, spanning. Hmm. Either way. Wow. Lots of people all over people. are inspired by you. People all over the world. <laughs> Join hands. Start up. <laughs> All right, we should pray. Let's in the name of the it. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, we ask that you may send forth the Holy Spirit upon us today, that you may strengthen in our hearts the grace that was given to us at baptism. And that's just you may ask that you may always keep us um, grateful for the gift of the Most Holy Eucharist, that it may stir in our hearts the fire of your love, and it may break the bonds of sin in our lives and strengthen our identity as your beloved sons and daughters. Pray for all of those who are furthest from the Eucharist and pray for all of those who um, who don't experience intimacy with you, that they may, through the gift of the Eucharist, know your love, your closeness, and your tenderness. We ask this all through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary and Pope St. John Paul II, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Wow. Yeah. So we are back to talking about the Eucharist. We are. It's awesome. Yeah whole year of it and then back we go i love it hey i'm not gonna what's not to it. love you know one hand throws the dart another hand guides it <laughs> that's so right this is where we're supposed it's to been be a few episodes since you've said that so i'm glad that that came back yeah it's the truth you know <laughs> it is just floating on the wings of divine providence mm-hmm. sometimes those wings go places you're like really lord mm-hmm. and other times like tis good lord to be here <laughs> yeah that's a Bible joke. Yeah, I get it. I get it. I got it. It was good. It was good. <laughs> so we're in uh, 1382. 1382 to 1340. 1401. Oh, 1401. That's, that's right. That's what I had. That is correct. That's what I had, too. 1382 okay. to 1401, the Paschal Banquet. <clears throat> Quite a mm. few... Uh, this is kind of a lengthier section than what we paragraphs. would yeah. normally cover, but a lot of it was sort of repeat of themes mm-hmm. that we've touched on um, in last last season's episode or the year of the Eucharist video. So yeah, but some of it's like, man, these paragraphs could be whole episodes themselves. Oh my goodness, I know, it, like just rich. You know? uh-huh. So I don't I feel know. Gluttonous how you... with this catechism. You know? I know this I, banquet. I don't know how you want to dissect this. I guess we just start rolling. Start and, rolling. Okay. First of know, all, where are we at? Where are we at in this? We're in the catechism. We're in part two. Mm-hmm. So. Se- the first part is all about the creed, second part mm-hmm. sacraments, mm-hmm. then moral life, then prayer. Mm-hmm. Second part, broken up in the sacraments, we're in the third sacrament, 
the uh, the Holy Eucharist. Gotcha. So, and we're we're in the near the end of the section on the Holy Eucharist mm-hmm. here, the Paschal banquet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the first two paragraphs, 1382 and 1383, uh, give us sort of an overview of this. The Mass is at the same time and inseparably the sacrificial memorial in which the sacrifice of the cross is perpetuated and the sacred banquet of communion with the Lord's body and blood. So both and, both Mm -hmm. and at the same time. Sacrifice and Mm -hmm. banquet. Mm -hmm. Sacrificial banquet. Mm -hmm. Mm. It continues, but the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice is wholly directed toward the intimate union of the faithful with Christ through communion. Wow. The whole thing wow. is oriented in that direction. Wow. The union of the faithful in Christ. The intimate union. The intimate union. Of the faithful with Christ through communion. To receive communion is to receive Christ himself, who has offered himself for us. That's mm. beautiful. I know. And it seems in some ways so elementary, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, mm-hmm. the Mass is about drawing us into union with Christ, but you think about like, because it is a sacrificial uh, a sacrificial offering that even this Christ sacrifice were drawn into an intimate union with the sacrifice of Calvary. I mean, mm-hmm. that that is something else right mm-hmm. there. And then through mm-hmm. his presence in the body and blood of Christ, wonderful. Mm. So this is where, where it's toward, the intimate union of us with Christ, the altar around which the church is gathered in the celebration of the Eucharist represents the two aspects of the same mystery, the altar of the sacrifice and the table of the Lord. Mm-hmm. Okay. Th- continuing in 1383, this is all the more so since the Christian altar is the symbol of Christ himself, present in the midst of the assembly of his faithful, both as the victim offered for our reconciliation and as the food from heaven who is giving himself to us. Okay. Right. Right. And you get a whole lot of like this both in like, all right, is it something being sacrificed or is it a meal? And mm-hmm. we get the both gets first gets built off in the Passover, right? Mm-hmm. The Paschal, the lambs that were slaughtered, they were offered, and then their their flesh was cooked, and then people ate it, mm-hmm. right? So it's, it's mm-hmm. both and. It's the, because mm-hmm. Jesus is that new lamb of God. Right, right. Mm. Mm. So the liturgy expresses this unity of sacrifice and communion. So again, both and, sacrifice and communion, we're seeing that in the liturgy as well. All right, that's sort of the overview of this Paschal banquet that we are discussing today. I am stalling because there was something I was going to say and can't recall. So I'm going to talk slower and longer, but it's not coming to me. So we're moving on. All right. So uh, 1384, this is a section called Take This and Eat It, All of You. So the section on communion. Um, Holy communion. Yes. Uh, 1384, the Lord addresses an invitation to us, urging us to receive him in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. So that, of course, is from John 6. So the Lord invites us and then urges us. Mm -hmm. Those are powerful words. Yeah. Yeah. Urges. Mm -hmm. So this is, if you don't have this no life within you. Mm -hmm. So that's important. And then the next one's about preparation, right? Mm -hmm. To prepare ourselves for this. And and also in a a specific way mentions anyone conscious of grave sin must receive the sacrament of reconciliation Mm -hmm. before coming to communion. Mm -hmm. So grave sin, another another word for mortal sin. So Mm -hmm. any anybody who's conscious of mortal sin. And that comes from St. Paul. And it's quote St. Paul right above there. I think Mm -hmm. we we covered that in an earlier podcast. Mm -hmm. Right. We did. So we need to, the Lord invites us and urges us, we need to prepare ourselves for Mm -hmm. so great a holy moment. That makes sense. We're being invited and urged to this. There needs to be preparation on our part. So the next few paragraphs talk about that. One is by an examination of conscience, that we actually examine ourselves um, and that we recognize that reality, that St. Paul's exhortation, St. Paul's words, and we know that we shouldn't be eating and drinking without discerning that we are worthy to do so, that we're not in a state of grave sin. And of course, the sacrament proper to the removal of grave sin is the sacrament of reconciliation. You right? got that right. Okay. <clears throat> and then how else do we, pre- we prepare? Well, we humble ourselves with ardent faith. 1386 kind of touches on that. Before so great a sa- sacrament, the faithful can only echo humbly and with ardent faith the words of the centurion. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. So we examine ourselves. You say that in Latin, Julia. I know. You say it in Latin. I'm sure it's beautiful. Oh, it, yeah. (laughs) 
Domine non sub dignum ut entra sub tectum meum, set tantum dig verbo et sanibitor anima mea. Beautiful. Right. So we humble ourselves. We have this ardent faith. We echo those words. Mm -hmm. That's another way we are preparing. What about this um, this quote, the Divine Liturgy of St. John Christensen? Did you read that in there? I did. I did. It reads, O oh, Son of God, bring me into communion today with your mystical supper. I shall not tell your enemies the secret, nor kiss you with Judas's kiss. But like the good thief, I cry, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This this humility, this recognition of I I shall not kiss you with the don't let me betray Judas. this gift that you're giving to me, mm -hmm. like Judas betrayed. Mm -hmm. And also to recognize our unworthiness, yet the Lord places us there like the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, mm -hmm. the good thief. So how else do we prepare? Pre -prepare? This continues in 1387. We observe the fast required, mm -hmm. right? So an hour? An hour before receiving Holy Communion, which, mm -hmm. man, if you can't do that, it means it's like you're stuffing your face with Skittles on the way into the church, mm -hmm. right? Because mm -hmm. especially at Sunday Mass, I guess daily mm -hmm. Mass, maybe it's a little it's a little tighter. But mm -hmm. um, just so everybody knows, like before one hour, it was three hours. Mm -hmm. And then before that, it was midnight the night before whenever you're going to receive Holy Communion. So mm -hmm. an hour really ain't really much at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So fasting from everything except water and... Medicine, Medicine. Yeah. right. Okay. Um, and then how else do we prepare? Again, in 1387, our bodily demeanor. So our gestures, our clothing, mm. this ought to convey the respect, solemnity, and joy of this moment when Christ becomes our guest. So again, Christ invites us. He urges us. Sure. And our proper response to that is to prepare, to right. receive him worthily. And all of those like external preparations, those should reflect an interior attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people get fresher. Well, it's all just externals. People, you know, like... Does it really matter if I dress up for mass because it, you know, the Lord knows my heart? Mm -hmm. Well, yes and no, because uh, if our hearts are there, we want to give the Lord our best. Right? Mm -hmm. It's why I give him the best of vestments. We give him the mm -hmm. best of vessels. Mm -hmm. You say, well, Jesus is he's present no matter what. Well, yes, but we give him the best that we have to offer. Mm -hmm. So that's why, you know, the, the phrase, your, wear your Sunday best to mm -hmm. mass. Well, because that's the most important thing you do for mm -hmm. each week. And if you really believe that's meeting Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, well, we should probably... Um, you know, behave, look, mm -hmm. act a certain way. Mm -hmm. Of course, those are externals. The Lord knows the heart, but mm -hmm. um, sometimes the externals are a sign of where our heart is. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. Very good. Um, it is in keeping with the very meaning of the Eucharist that the faithful, if they have the required dispositions, receive communion when they participate in Mass. So this is in 1388. So, yes, we should. We're encouraged to receive communion when we participate in Mass. As the Second Vatican Council says, that more perfect form of participation in the Mass, whereby the faithful, after the priest's communion, receive the Lord's body from the same sacrifice, is warmly recommended. Mm -hmm. So we, we are obliged by the Church to take part in the liturgy on Sundays and feast days. So we are to be there worshiping God every Sunday, every feast day, obliged. Mm -hmm. But we're only obliged to receive our Lord in Holy Communion once a year. Once a year. Right? And so that's interesting to think about that reality. Of course, we're encouraged to receive sure. Him more regularly, even daily, if we have those proper dispositions, if we've examined ourselves, if mm -hmm. we're in a state of grace where we can. Um, but we don't have that obligation to receive right. Him every week. And just so everybody knows, you know, the, the first one, taking part in the Divine Liturgy every Sunday, skipping Mass on Sunday is a mortal sin. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about not coming and if there's grave matter. Now, there's a difference between missing Mass, right? Mm -hmm. And just saying, like, I was in the hospital and I didn't make it to Mass. Okay, that's, that's mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. you didn't have to go. But mm -hmm. if we're, you know, we could have gone, but we didn't, and mm -hmm. we just didn't get around to it, that is gravely sinful. Mm -hmm. um, so just so everybody knows, you know, sometimes people get questions about that from their family. Probably everybody listening to this is making it to Mass every mm -hmm. Sunday, but maybe not. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Right. There it is. Ignorance is gone. Now we know. And knowing is half we the We get battle. to live in the light. <laughs> Sorry, my husband would get that joke. We, we are like watching really old G.I. Joe episodes, like from the oh. 80s. And after every episode, there's like this PSA about like... I don't know. It's really weird mm -hmm. stuff. But at the end, they're like, but now you know. And knowing is half the battle. G.I. Joe. <laughs>
That's really cool. So anyway, cool. now Man. you know that you need to go to Max. Are you getting like Best Wife Ever awards for watching GI old G.I. Joe reruns with your husband? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah? Uh, or is it you that wants to watch it and you're dragging him to watch G.I. Joe? Definitely not the case. <laughs> 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 definitely not the case. Uh, um, okay, so yes, the church does strongly encourage the faithful to receive the Holy Eucharist on Sundays and feast days, or more often still, even daily. Right. Okay. When when we have these proper dispositions, I guess I should mention because this is a common question in 1388, where it said um, the faithful are encouraged to receive if they have requ- the required dispositions, and then it talks about in a little footnote that the faithful may receive the Holy Eucharist only a second time on the same day. Sometimes, you know, if you are going to a wedding mass or a funeral mass, and then you're going to a vigil mass in the same day. I get that question a lot. Like, can I receive communion both times that I'm at mass? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only twice. Mm -hmm. And the second time has to be at mass. So let's say you go to mass in the morning and then you're in the hospital and somebody comes around and brings Holy communion. That second time can't be outside of mass. Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because you you were just at the, you were just at the, Right. You were at the sacrifice at Mass, right? right? Okay, okay. Right. So, but if it's flip-flopped and uh-huh. you're at the hospital, somebody comes around and brings Holy Communion, then uh-huh. you get discharged, you go to the Vigil Mass uh-huh. in the evening, you can receive Holy Communion there because the second time uh-huh. has to be at Mass. Uh-huh. Yeah. Right, okay. And now you know. The more you know. <laughs> brought to you by G.I. Joe. <laughs> All right. Um, and then this section ends with paragraph 1390. Since Christ is sacramentally present under each of the species, communion under the species of bread alone makes it possible to receive all the fruit of Eucharistic grace. You did a great episode video once about Mm. that reality. I think there was a chicken involved. There was. Not a live chicken, a dead chicken. (laughs) There was a dead chicken involved. Mm -hmm. So, um... (laughs) Yeah. Actually, the Bolton article's about this, that this upcoming week. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're not going to like. Well, so the uh, the archbishop's given permission to receive under both species, beginning oh. Divine Mercy Sunday. Oh wow! So basically, I just kind of laid out in the bulletin all the mm-hmm. different considerations for mm-hmm. for doing that, and mm-hmm. we're going to be thoughtful and all that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. So oh, very good. Yeah. But when we when we are only receiving him under one species, we're still receiving all of him. All of them. All of yeah. Him. You can't right. divide Christ. So mm-hmm. so you're not getting half of Jesus, mm-hmm. anything like that. Because and this was the chicken analogy, right? Mm-hmm. And this was actually from from a parishioner kind of shared this with mm-hmm. me in the thoughts of her own prayer mm-hmm. is she said well when you butcher a chicken you know when when you cut open the body the blood the blood's present so mm-hmm. because the body's present the mm-hmm. blood's the blood's in the body it's like mm-hmm. well that's exactly right um so right yeah we the theological term is concomitance okay mm-hmm. yeah good good even and even and yeah. so, even this 1390 mentions that the most common form in the Latin rite, that's what we are, Roman Catholics, Latin rite Catholics, is to receive Holy Communion um, under just the single species of the body of Christ. Um, but the sign of communion is more complete when given under both kinds, since it is from that sign the Eucharistic meal appears more clearly. And this is the usual form of receiving communion in the Eastern rite. Mm. So Ukrainian Catholics and Maronites. And, but oftentimes they don't receive directly from the chalice. This might actually be an interesting little, little thing. So either there's uh, four ways to receive Holy Communion, receive the precious blood. Mm-hmm. One is to consume from the chalice. Mm-hmm. Basically, it would only do that in the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church. The other is intinction. So dipping the, the body of Christ in the precious blood and placing it directly on the tongue. Only priests and deacons are allowed to do that just for how kind of like oof, mm-hmm. uh, that can be. And uh, the other ones are with a spoon. So, and this happens often in the uh, Eastern rites where they will place a, a piece of the body of Christ on the spoon with a dip it in the precious blood. And then the person will lift their head all the way back and open their mouths and then pour in the, the body and blood of our Lord into the mouth. Mm. And, and you would of course get, you know, like a, a, a gold casted spoon for mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the other one would be with a straw. Hmm. Again, a, a very nice straw. Hmm. So, How about that? Yeah. Those now last you know. two, not often done in the Roman church, mm-hmm. but actually permissible. Hmm. So hmm. the more you know. <laughs> now you know. And knowing is half the battle. Okay. The, then this uh, next section talks about the fruits. Yeah. The fruits of Holy Communion. So here's what it is. Here's how the Lord is inviting and urging us to, to, mm-hmm. uh, to feed on him, right? To eat 
his flesh, drink his blood. Here's how we need to prepare ourselves to receive him worthily. And here's the fruits of it when we're in this state of grace and when we're able to receive him. First, Holy Communion augments our union with Christ. The principal fruit of receiving the Eucharist in Holy Communion is an intimate union with Christ Jesus. So it unifies Mm -hmm. us with him, with our Savior. Wow. As if that's not enough. There is more. There is (laughs) more, which is hard to believe. Right, right. Yeah, right. union with Christ. Mm-hmm. The Son of God wants to be in union with us, which is baffling in and of itself that he's not just like, hey, let me know if you need any help, but actually he wants mm-hmm. to uh, be in an intimate union with us. Mm-hmm. And uh, what's to say augments, Holy Communion augments that mm-hmm. union with Christ, mm-hmm. strengthens it, enlivens it. Mm-hmm. So. so it unifies us with our Savior. And in 1392, it talks about how it preserves, increases, and renews the life of grace that we received at baptism. Yeah. And it's great. It uses what material food produces in our bodily life, Holy Communion wonderfully achieves in our spiritual life. Mm -hmm. Now, what's it like to go through life without food? Well, you get get tired, you get hangry, you get a bit cranky, Mm -hmm. you just don't have the energy. Mm -hmm. And Holy Communion does that for us, right? It it, it, uh, gives us peace in the soul, gives mm-hmm. us strength for the Christian life, enlivens our faith. So mm-hmm. um, yeah, what food does for the body, spiritual food does for our souls. Mm. The growth in Christian life needs the nourishment of Eucharistic communion, the bread for our pilgrimage mm. until the moment of death when it will be given to us as viaticum. Okay. Holy communion, this next one talks about holy communion separates us from sin. Now, we talked about the sacrament proper to the removal of grave sin, mortal sin, Mm -hmm. is reconciliation, the sacrament of reconciliation, not the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. But for venial sins, the reality is is that Holy Communion separates us from Um, our venial sins. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Worthy reception of Holy Communion, I should say. And even 1394 kind of augments this use augment again. It might be the word of the day, huh? <laughs> it, it breaks our disordered attachments. Mm-hmm. I really love that, mm-hmm. that Holy Communion is one of those things that comes into our soul like medicine mm-hmm. to break up um, our bad our bad habits, basically, mm-hmm. those attachments towards whatever they are, pride, mm-hmm. food, you know, greed, all those things. Mm-hmm. Like it, it takes the jackhammer in there. Yeah. Boop, 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 boop. Right. Wipes away our sins and then strengthens us to to be firmer firmer resolved not right. to fall into sin again. So it's good it, it breaks these breaks these up because they say breaking up is hard to do. They do say that. They do I've say heard, that. I've heard that I've before. Heard that. Yeah. I don't know what if that was about sin or something else. Right. It also preserves us from future mortal sins. Right. Right? It's almost like getting a getting a uh, getting some medicine to prevent you from mm-hmm. getting sick. It's like getting mm-hmm. a vaccine. Maybe mm-hmm. we shouldn't Mm-hmm. Those analogies get loaded with <laughs> right. meaning, but right. uh, but it, it helps us avoid mm-hmm. mortal sin, mm-hmm. which that's good news because mm-hmm. who wants to fall into deadly sin? Mm-hmm. Not me. Right. No. Right. Right. Okay. So yeah, it's it wash, wipes away our, our venial sins again when we are properly disposed mm-hmm. to receive him. It strengthens us in our, our life and nourishes us and preserves us from falling into to mortal sin in the future. Wow in addition to unifying us with Christ, right, the Savior of the world. And then unifying us with the church. That's the next one. It brings about unity in the church, and that comes straight from St. Paul. You know, we are all one body. Mm -hmm. We share in the the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Um, So it fulfills this desire of Christ to gather everybody one. So so basically, we are one, not because we say we're one, Mm -hmm. but we're one because the same blood flows through our veins, right? Mm -hmm. We're part of the same family because we got the same bloodline, and that bloodline Mm -hmm. is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So it's his body and blood that draws us into the same the same family, not just because we we say it is. Mm -hmm. Right? We're all one here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Got it. Right. So like for for Catholics who are not in the state of grace able to receive or who aren't receiving, or for our brothers, Christian brothers and sisters who have not responded or heard the call of the Lord to the mm-hmm. table of the Lord or are not receiving the Lord in his in his body and in his blood. When we as Catholics, as faithful Catholics who are in the state of grace and in a, in a way worthy to receive him, when we receive him, is that what this paragraph is saying, is that we are unifying this body even to all of those who are not able to receive him at that time? I, I don't think so. I think it's, it's like the Eucharist makes the church. Mm. So we are... 
we are being renewed as the church. Mm -hmm. Just like Holy Communion renews our and augments our uh, like rela- intimacy with Christ. Mm-hmm. It does that with each other, I think, mm-hmm. is okay. with all those who receive. Gotcha. Um, right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So you feel, I don't feel like part of the church. Nobody ever calls. Well, go to Mass. Yeah. You know, it's like right. that's where the Lord's going to strengthen our, uh, mm-hmm. our uh, unity. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then, of course, receiving the Eucharist commits us to the poor. So if it's nourishing us, if it's wiping away our sins, if it's helping preserve us from committing future mortal sins, if it's unifying us as one, the one body in Christ that we are, mm-hmm. then ultimately w- that makes sense. That makes a common sense that it would also send us out into the world to be committed to the poor among us for the birth of good works, right? So that's that reality as well, is that the Eucharist does commit us to the life the, of the poor. Um, charity itself is given to us, mm-hmm. right? Charity itself in Jesus Christ, love itself. Mm-hmm. And that's not just for us to say, oh, it's so good to be loved. I just mm-hmm. love being near Jesus. Mm-hmm. It's so that our hearts catch fire. And then mm-hmm. the same love that Christ has for us, we then have with other people. Mm-hmm. We have for other people, toward other people. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's actually, uh, it's a great responsibility to be given the the love itself because then you have to be transformed into that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This quote, St. John Chrysostom again here. Am I saying that right? Chrysostom. I knew, okay, close, but not quite. You have tasted the blood of the Lord, yet you do not recognize your brother. You dishonor this table when you do not judge worthy of sharing your food. Someone judged worthy to take part in this meal. God freed you from all your sins and invited you here, but you have not become more merciful. Mm. So again, these external fruits, like what sure. what is showing? If you're feeding on Christ himself, is you're, if you're eating his flesh and drinking his blood, you're properly disposed to receive him in that way, your life should have effects of that. You should be seeing external fruits of that. And mm-hmm. like you said, charity and love. Yeah. Right. It reminds me of a, I think it was a Holy Thursday homily that our, our good friend Pope Benedict gave. Mm. And if I, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast, mm. but I'm, I've probably used it before. But he says, he it says something like, at the Last Supper, our Lord sets off a series of transformations that will have a chain reaction throughout the entire world, where first he, he transforms death into love, and he, transforms a, and he transforms murder into offering, and then he transforms a, he trans, from, and then in that he transforms a meal to this, ah, oh gosh, I'm losing this, I should have, but he transforms a meal into the sacrifice, and then bread and wine is transformed into his body and blood, and then we are transformed as we receive that, and then the world is transformed mm. through us who have received that. Mm-hmm. So he's much more elegant, but you kind of get the gist of mm-hmm. like, he sets off this chain reaction of mm-hmm. by transforming uh, death into love, it just sets off this chain reaction, mm. which ought to explode throughout the entire world through the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. I love him, by mm. the way. Yeah. Okay. He's like the world's grandfather. Oh, I love it. Okay. Um, what else? The Eucharist and the unity of Christians is the title of paragraph 1398. Sure. Um, And in this, we're hearing this, the more painful the experience of the divisions in the church, which break the common participation in the table of the Lord, the more more urgent are our prayers to the Lord, that the time of complete unity among all who believe in him may return. So the more painful it is that we recognize these divisions, that these divisions exist, that we're not all feeding on this one blood that is meant to run through all of our veins as as Christians, the more we feel that, the more urgent is our, our call, our duty to pray, mm-hmm. right? And, and so, yeah, it touches on different kind of realities about Eastern Orthodoxy. So like mm-hmm. the Russian Orthodoxy and whether their Eucharist is, is valid, whether it's actually the body and blood of Christ and mm-hmm. whether Mass is valid. And for them, it would be yes, mm-hmm. um, because they have a valid holy orders. Right? you got to have a validly ordained priest um, to, to make the Eucharist mm-hmm. present, to offer the sacrifice. Mm-hmm. They do. Um, but many of our ecclesiastical, all the ecclesial communities derived from the Reformation and separated from the church have not preserved the proper reality of the Eucharist mystery in its fullness, especially because of the absence of the sacrament of holy orders. Mm-hmm. So because of that, um, then we don't partake in it because um, mm-hmm. you need the holy, you need, you need a priest to, to mm-hmm. make the Eucharist present. If there's mm-hmm. no priest, there's um, bread, only bread and wine. Mm-hmm. 
So that was 1399, talking about the Eastern churches. 1400 talks about the ecclesial communities derived from the Reformation and separated from the church. And then 1401 talks about this reality of when a grave necessity arises, which is very Mm -hmm. interesting, because I heard about this happening, like it happened a while ago, but I heard about someone doing this, and I'm like, I don't know if that sounds right, Mm -hmm. that that's a reality. But then I read it, I'm like, okay. Good. So 1401 says that when in the ordinary's judgment a grave necessity arises, grave necessity. Ordinary's ca- judgment is the bishop of a diocese. The bishop. Not the priest, mm-hmm. not the deacon, mm-hmm. the bishop of a diocese. Mm-hmm. And not the auxiliary bishop, only the one who's actually in charge. Okay. So when the bishop, at his judgment, in this grave necessity, Catholic ministers may give the sacraments of Eucharist, penance, and anointing of the sick to other Christians not in full communion with the Catholic Church who ask for them of their own will, provided they give evidence of holding the Catholic faith regarding these sacraments and possess the required dispositions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I believe since the publication of the Catechism, I could be wrong, so this is, this could be wrong, Sure. that the allowance for anointing of the sick is actually widened a little bit. That uh, that if there's, in like, it doesn't have to go through the bishop. It could actually be the person asked for it of their own accord. They express the Catholic faith, and they don't have access to their own ministers like that. So mm-hmm. like if somebody's unconscious, mm-hmm. no can do, right? Mm-hmm. I got to double check that. Mm-hmm. And I okay. should know that off the top of my head. So Okay, okay. Anywho, um, interesting stuff. Yeah. So that was, I think that... You know, I kind of talked about that when we read it. We just did a whole we just a whole year of episodes on the Eucharist. So a lot of that was really just a review, a reminder of a lot of things that we've talked about in yeah. the year past. Okay. Good. It was a trip down memory lane, Julia. It was. Yeah. Uh, and just to be reminded of the why of Holy Communion. That the Lord is calling us, drawing us to himself, inviting us, urging us, preparing us to receive him. Why? So that we can enter into this intimate union with him. Mm-hmm. What? That's amazing. Yeah. That the God of the universe wants to be in union with us. Mm. You'd think he has better things to do, but he doesn't. Mm. What could be more better than sharing his life with his beloved children? Mm. Mm. I love him. I know. Mm. All right. So, yeah, you do that. Let's see. There were a few in brief paragraphs kind of summarizing all of this. And let's see. Anyone who desires to receive Christ in Eucharistic communion must be in the state of grace. Anyone aware of having sinned mortally must not receive communion without having received absolution in the sacrament of penance. Communion with the body and blood of Christ increases the communicant's union with the Lord, forgives his venial sins, and preserves him from grave sins. Since receiving this sacrament strengthens the bonds of charity between the communicant and Christ, it also reinforces the unity of the church as the mystical body of Christ. The church warmly recommends that the faithful receive Holy Communion when they participate in the celebration of the Eucharist. She obliges them to do so at least once a year. Hmm. Okay. Where do you want to go? Prayer. Prayer? Did you find one? No, I hit the wall. <laughs> Look at that. I was, I was trying to hit that prayer. What is prayer? Oh, yeah. well, See if I can do it. Oh, the church is apostolic. That sounds good, too. Yeah, we'll go there. <laughs> Whoops. Sorry, wall. <laughs> it's okay. Is it? And that's okay. It better be. It's not the first one. I'm pretty sure there's other. That one, though, looks like it kind of got in there. Anywho. You, you are. We've talked about this. Your accuracy with the darts is actually rather impressive. Well, thank you. you I, you're welcome. Do you mean it? I do mean it. Stop Plus, Because I've thrown the dart. <laughs> Have you thrown the dart? Well, no. Oh, she, she's Chris, throwing a dart. I think yeah, so. Right. One time. Right. No. No. I mean, it was Valerie threw a dart. I don't, I don't know. know. Anyway. Anyway, mm. let's pray, shall we? Please. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift of our lives and for the gift of this day and for calling us to your table where we are united with you in intimate union, continuing to draw us in ever increasing ways into the depths of your love. Help us to have the grace and the strength and the courage to amend our lives and to receive absolution um, from all the ways that we have failed you and have fallen into sin. And guide us again in all your ways, in all truth, goodness, and beauty. For you are Lord forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.